okay? Good, good. Now, Pastor Kath came up and said that the kids don't like scary faces. I don't either, okay? So make sure you've got your smile on and your amens when you agree to something and just just enjoy. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, just enjoy God's presence today. Uh, it w- wasn't it an exciting service? Yeah, the kids were amazing and um, it was so powerful even with the testimonies of Jamie and Oliver of what God is doing in their lives. God is transforming them and that is the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work within us, changing us from the inside out. And I just want to encourage us as a church that we think generationally. Let's not just stop at us, but think of the generation. You saw the kids up here, and you saw how the Holy Spirit is moving. Take opportunity to encourage the young people and the kids today. Encourage them, spur them on as they transform to be like Jesus also. So for those of you that have just joined us or you, you first week, we are in a, a series on transformation. And uh, Uh, I pray that God has been encouraging you through the series. You heard some testimonies. They were awesome, weren't they? Thank you, guys. You know, it is not easy to share life. It is not easy to express how God is speaking to us. And it was just awesome hearing those testimonies. And when we started off um, in week one, we, we started off talking about Uh, Why do we need to transform? Why do we need to change? And it was all about reflecting Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. Uh, And our key scripture was, is for the series 2 Corinthians uh, 3.18. And it says, we all with unveiled faces, continually seeing as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are progressively being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to even more glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Let's just pray. Let's just pray this morning. Lord, we just thank you that we just get to come and sit at your feet right now. I just pray, Lord, for your presence to come and just be with us, fall afresh. Your presence is here already, and we just pray that it will just continue to move amongst your people. Lord, I pray for receptive hearts. I pray, Lord, that you will meet us at the point of where we are. I pray, Lord, that I will step aside and allow allow your Holy Spirit to speak to your church today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So as we spoke about week one, we talked about why do we want to transform, to be like Jesus, to reflect him. And then we went on to talk about purpose, transformation with purpose. Why is it that we're wanting to transform so that we could move into purpose? And it was lovely how Jess shared a testimony about output. It's not just about input, 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 but it's about output. And then we talked about the lost, about the harvest being plentiful. Laborers are few, but the harvest is plentiful. And last week, how we landed it was on looking at how Jesus is our anchor. He is our anchor. And as a church, the vision of our church is transformation. We all, we, look, we want transformation in our lives and we want transformation for those that are yet to know Jesus. So as a church, our vision is transforming lives through audacious faith, inspiring hope, and extravagant love. That is what, as a church, we aspire. That is what we are wanting to move together in Christ with. Now, our key scriptures last week was Hebrews 10, 22 to 25, and it says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with water. Verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, For he who promised is faithful. Amen. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as the day day approaches. Verse 22, drawing near to God. And verse 23, holding on unswervingly to the hope 
we profess. You see, when we spoke last week about the anchor your hope in an almighty God, we spoke about the anchor. What does the anchor do? The anchor steadies the boat. The anchor keeps us there. The anchor avoids us from veering off into what, what you know, into, into life really. And this morning, holding on to Jesus and drawing near to him is going to be how we continue to transform in him, that we do not drift away. Now, during the last few weeks, I've been talking about my patients. Now, every patient I get all of a sudden during the series, I think, oh, I could share this with church, you know? Uh, because when we, uh, I work as a physio in the NHS, and when I get patients, the idea behind giving them exercises and advice is to see some change in them. They long to see change in their situation and their condition and whatever they are struggling with. And as a physio, I want to see them changing as well. So there's transformation and change, which is what we expected. So in this last week, I had a lovely uh, young lady come to me. She's a teacher with back pain, and uh, I gave her some advice uh, three weeks ago uh, and uh, to give her some advice and give her exercises, and she went away, and she came back, and we were sitting, and we were talking, and I said, how are you doing? And she says, okay, and then, then I said, uh, how's your exercises? And she said that I am doing my exercises when it hurts. That is not what you tell a physio. So she said, I am only doing my exercises when my back hurts. And good job we have masks still. We can hide a lot of expressions with this mask. And I was like, Annie, that's her name. Please don't go tell. If you see her, Annie who has back pain, please, it's, it's not her. But, you know, that is not what we talked about the last time. We spoke about giving you these exercises so you would go every day, you would do the exercises. Why? To avoid the back pain from coming on, to strengthen your muscles so that you'll be stronger, to avoid it so it will be a preventative measure. What you've done is you've reacted. Instead of being proactive by preventing these, uh, this back pain from coming, you've been reactive. Only when the back pain came did you start doing this. You see, this is so apparent in our lives, isn't it? Say, for example, a basic thing that we do, like brushing our teeth, yeah, or going to the dentist. We know that we need to brush our teeth twice a day. We need to go to the re dentist regularly. Nobody likes going to the dentist. I don't mind, but nobody else seems to like going to the dentist. Because if we are proactive in protecting our teeth, then we don't become reactive when we get cavities and we run to the dentist. But we've been proactive. It's the same thing with so many things of our lives. If you think of students, for those of you that are students, you've got the proactive student that is studying diligently, and then you've got the reactive that gets up in the morning, oh, I've got a test, I need to study. Yes, so I hope you're not that student. But there is the proactive and then there's, there's the reactive. So if you think of this in the spiritual realm, I need to ask you a question. Are you a proactive Christian or a reactive Christian? Are you that Christian or that follower of Jesus that is daily picking up their Bibles and reading the Word of God? Are you that follower of Jesus that is seeking after the Lord and going into His presence? Or are you that reactive Christian or follower of Jesus that suddenly gets a problem and you are dusting, taking the dust off your Bible and then turning to any scripture? That's reactive. And this morning, for us to continue on our transformation in Jesus, to reflect Jesus, we need to be proactive. We need daily habits because I tell you what, when the storm comes, when the pain comes, you are ready for it. You are ready for it because you are anchored in an almighty God. You are great with your daily habits of reading, of being in his presence and seeking after the Lord. You see, 
only when we have a hope, only when our anchor and our hope is in Jesus, in our almighty God, then we can give. Pastor Kat spoke about that. You can only give what you have. If you do not have hope, how can you give hope? You see, you find hope. You be that person that is strong in the Lord, and you be that person full of hope. And that's what um, uh, Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. But we have to have that hope first to give that hope. And this morning, are you somebody that is full of hope today? And I pray you are. I pray you are. You've come to the right place because Jesus is here. And guess what? He is the giver of hope today. He's our firm foundation. He is the one that will anchor you. He will keep you Firmly grounded. You see, when we are proactive Christians, we are building on a firm foundation. We are building on the rock. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. So if you are building, if you are building on these habits daily, daily, guys, Destiny Church, we need to be building daily. Be that proactive Christian, and you will see your life transformed because you are building on a firm foundation. And if you are a reactive Christian, guess what? You are building on sand. And you, unfortunately, when the hard times come, you will not be able to hold it together. So as we become people that are anchored in the hope of an almighty God, guess what? Now we can become a beacon of hope to the believers. Notice AB. I'm moving to ABC today, right? So anchor yourself in an almighty God. You will become a beacon of hope to the believers. Hebrews 10 verse 24 says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Now, in the first week, I spoke about unity as a, as a church, how powerful unity is. And you see, as we go through this transformation process, God is at work within us, and, it, and like Jamie said in, in the video that he did, it's a process, and, and like uh, 2 uh, Corinthians says, it's, we are progressively being transformed. And in order for us to continue on this process, in, to, on this journey of faith, we need each other. Amen? Okay, I hope you believe that, because you didn't sound very convincing that we do need each other. That is the bottom line. Practically, emotionally, spiritually, bottom line is we need each other. And if you, you are sitting here or you are online and you have got it in your mind that you can do it on your own, I'm sorry, that is not a thought from our God. Because God created us with community in mind. You know, when God created the earth, he created everything. But the only thing he said was not right was Adam was alone. And then he created us. But men might be thinking, oh, Lord, I think you made a mistake there. But no, he did because he, that was the start, wasn't it? It was the start of family. It was the start of togetherness. It was the start of life because that's what God created us for, community. And Romans 12 verse 5 says, so we who are many, that is all of us here, are nevertheless just one body in Christ. And individually, we are many parts. We are parts one of another, but we are mutually dependent on each other. Now, the Bible is saying we are all so different. We are all many. We are all individually different. But we are so different, yet... The Holy Spirit connects us. I still can't get over that. Now, Pastor Kath and I are friends for 20 years, and she's sitting right in front, so I can pick on her because she'll forgive me. Now, Pastor Kath and I are like chalk and cheese. How we are friends, I do not know. Let me tell you a bit about how different we are. So, for Kath, a lovely day would be going to the spa and 
relaxing and chilling out and you just do 10 minutes, 10 seconds, sorry, of massage and she'll fall asleep, you know, and she's just all chilled out and relaxing. And, and for me, it's getting up early and go for, going for a swim in the sea and then going for a hike with lots of food involved. Different. Kath, no spice. Me, too much spice. But, but what is so great about this is that we are still mutually dependent on each other. I tell you why. When we go on, um, sometimes we get the opportunity to go away on uh, mission trips as a church. But before we go on mission trips, we kind of like go to spy the land, Kath and I, to see where, how we're going to take our teams. Or sometimes we go on conferences together. And, um, and say, for example, we, we get to the conference and we get, get, uh, get off the train now, I am all about getting from A to B, yeah? So I have the sat-nav ready, listening attentively to where I am going to go. I'm as the crow flies, I'm looking. And as for Kath, she is so observant. She notices who she passes. She notices the traffic. She notices the shops. She notices the birds. She notices the sky. And I'm just as the crow flies, and here she's, and she's busy talking while she's observing all of this as well. How this woman does it, I do not know. But we are still mutually dependent on each other because I get Kat from where we've stopped to where we need to go, and she keeps me safe. I need her, and whether she likes it or not, she needs me. Yeah? So we are mutually dependent on each other. And today, that is the beauty of our connect groups, guys. That is where you can become mutually dependent on each other as believers of Christ. I just love this, that we can become a beacon of hope to each other in our connect groups. And I'm, I've got so many examples to share, but I'm just going to share one. When Rachel was born, right, I thought that she will come with a manual, yeah, how to take care of a baby. I thought I'll get a book. And all you moms are laughing at me thinking, never, it's never going to be like that. I'll get a book and it'll be all about how to take care of a baby. It was never like that. But I can tell you what, I had the best connect group, right? They would come to my house. They'll help me clean. They'll help me. They'll bring, up, bring in meals. They will help me with Rachel. And they were so good at doing the housework and, and the chores that my ironing never looked that good. Devotion, my husband was saying, who's been, who's been ironing my shirts because they're really good? How dare he, right? But that's, that, you know, that's how great our connect group was. They were meeting the need practically, emotionally, and spiritually there. They were a beacon of hope for me. And that is the power of our connect groups. So I would encourage you, make your connect group a priority. We have this opportunity, and let's go with that mentality of not, how can you serve me? Now, we have awesome connect group leaders. I can tell you that. We do, you know, and we do have awesome connect group leaders. These leaders meet at least once a month, Le these leaders do training, these leaders are reading books, these leaders are being equipped to be the best that they could be for you guys. And how brilliant would it be, because we are mutually dependent on each other, that you come with that mentality, how can I serve you? How can I serve you, my connect group leader? And that's how it should be in church as well. You see, maturity, when our babies and our children are little, they are totally dependent on us, isn't it? They're dependent for us to feed them, to clean them, to wash them, to tidy after them. But after a while, they become independent. They're kind of like eating on their own. They're kind of like tidying up and washing and, and they try to... But the greatest thing is interdependence. Now, I did a bit of study on this interdependence. If you've got an interdependent working team in an organization, in any strata of work that you do, if you've got an interdependent working team, 
Each team is bringing their strength to the table. It is a powerful thing. And can you imagine, as a body of Christ, if each of us brought our talents, brought our time, brought our treasures into the house of the Lord, operating as an interdependent team, how powerful we will be. And that is what God calls us to be to move from that dependence to independence, but to become interdependent on each other. And this morning, as we mature in Christ, and as we grow in Christ, and we are anchored in him and become a beacon of hope to believers, then we can actually become a channel of hope to our community, a channel of hope to our community, and that's even adding another layer to this whole process of transformation. What is a channel? A channel is a wide strait or waterway between two land masses, and it lies close to each other. It connects the two land masses, and like the English Channel, it runs between England and France, and it's like huge, it's 348 miles long. You see, As our lives transform to be like Jesus, and as I looked at this channel and as this straight waterway, just as how Jesus connects us to the Father, when we receive Christ into our lives and our lives are being transformed, we now become that channel that now connects others to Jesus. And it will not be like the Dead Sea, which we talked about, that just receives, receives, receives. But when we become that living water, when we, because Jesus is the living water, and when we become the living water, then others are drawn to Jesus because we are reflecting who Jesus is. And I'm reminded of Psalm 1, and I've got to read it, Psalm 1, blessed is the one who who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sits in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water which heals its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Verse four, Not so with the wicked. They are like the shaft that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment of sinners sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. And this morning, God calls us to be like that tree that is transforming that where transformation is happening. Just think of that tree, the power of the Holy Spirit that is working within us. You will be like that tree planted by the riverside that heals its fruit in season. Would you like to be like that tree, yielding fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither and whatever you do prospers? Anchor yourself in an almighty God. Be a proactive Christian. Be the one that is longing to be in the presence of the Lord and doing what he has called us to do. And I want to just focus on verse four there. Not so for the wicked. They are like the shaft that the wind blows away. And this is a key. And this is a key, church. Be planted in the house of the Lord. How can we be fruitful? How can we grow? How can we be fruitful if we are not planted? The Bible talks of shaft here. Shaft is like dust that is just moving around. It is useless. But in the kingdom of God, if we are planted like that tree in the river, along that riverbank, guess what? We are gonna grow. We are gonna transform to be like Jesus. And God calls us to be like that tree. And there are people, and a channel of hope to our community, there are people uh, that, that, ha- that are truly um, reaching out in the community. And we heard Brian, but two weeks ago, 
uh, I spoke about Paul, and Paul's life is so powerful. God was working in Paul's life. There was a transformation happening in Paul's life. And Paul never just went out to, he, he was a big impact in the community. He impacted the community of believers in Corinth, in Philippi, in Ephesus, in Rome. He, he impacted all of these communities. And I spoke about my dad two weeks ago of how he came to know Jesus, being a Hindu for generations of past and for some of his adult life and then becoming a Christian and how his life transformed to be like Jesus and how he goes on to become a pastor and, you know, impacts my mom's life and generations to come, my daughter and I as well. But what really impressed me about my, I know I'm being, I'm sorry, this is not pride, it's true. Speak to my husband as well. But what really encouraged me growing up and watching my dad is his impact in the community. When our schools needed somebody to bring order and words of encouragement and discernment into a situation, they would call him. When the police needed help in situations, they would call. Law courts needed order. He was a voice in the community. And why I tell you this is because God is calling us to be a voice in our community, a voice wherever you are. He is wanting you to be a channel of hope where you work, where you live, where you are. He calls us to be that voice. You know, even in your neighborhood, if things are not working right, do they come to you? Do they even know that you are a child of God? That's what God is calling us to be, that hope in our community. And Brian Jones is, is evidence of that, as we heard Brian and Stella's powerful testimony and how they are running the Moses Project, which is a charity that provides guidance, mentoring, and support to young male adults with addictions of drug and alcohol. And Stella and Brian spoke about their transformation in their lives. God changed their hearts from people you know, Brian said he hated those people he now loves. Who can do that? Only Jesus can bring that change in us. Only Jesus can transform our lives so it can be such radical changes today. And, and even as Stella spoke there, it was the transformation that occurred in their hearts and their lives that led them to impact their community. That is so powerful and that is your ABCs. Anchor yourself in an almighty God. Then you will become a beacon of hope to believers and a channel of hope to our community. And as a connect group, I would love for you this week, when you meet in small groups, we have small groups during the week, and I've spoken about our small groups. If you do not belong to one, please see somebody at the connect point to speak to one of us. We would love to get you involved in our connect groups. A few years ago, I was involved in a, in a connect group. I seem to move connections, but I was in another connect group, with, and there were the younger girls there. Um, and uh, we were talking. It wasn't my idea, but at that time, we were thinking, how can we impact our community? And it seems like a little thing, but what we did was we realized there are so many people in our community, the police, the fire he, the fire, fire people, yeah, firemen, that's the word, the fire uh, station, and, and, and businesses. And all we did was we took a box of chocolates or a box of biscuits with a card from our church saying, we are thinking about you and we thank you for your service. Something as small as that impacted our community. And we would love to be that voice. Wouldn't we love to be that voice, Destiny, that actually say that we want to impact our community? And that could be a next step for you. The other thing could be, you know what, you love to serve. You want to serve in your connect group. You want to serve in church because of what is going on in your life, because of the transformation. That could be you this morning that says, you know what, I want to serve. I want to be part of what's going on today. And even as we started this whole series, we, I brought a few visuals, so I'm just going to bring it out now. Sorry. So as we started the series, I, I, I spoke of a few visuals. Um, 
And uh, I mentioned the first week. Can anyone remember what I said in the first week? What was my visual? The milk bottle. You see, God calls us to move from immaturity to maturity. And when we come to Jesus, we move away from just being drinking milk to the mature things in Christ. And God calls us to feed, to feast at his table. And the second week, we looked at transformation with purpose. We looked at those that are yet to know Jesus. And I would encourage you, I would encourage you, do not forget that, that the harvest is plentiful. Keep praying for those that are lost. Keep praying for those that are yet to know, sir, uh, know Jesus. Start inviting them to the carol service. Start inviting them to our fun nativity service. Let's keep the lost in mind. Because when transformation occurs, it is not just for ourselves, but it is for others. And then we went on the third week, which was the box and anchoring ourselves in an almighty God. But as Kath and, and the youth had their boxes, in each of this box will be salvation, will be the gospel that is presented. And that is our starting point. And this morning, for those of you that are yet to know Jesus, for those of you that do not know Jesus as your Savior, and I might be just talking about transformation, I do not want to miss this opportunity right now to pray for you. So let's just bow our heads. For those of you that do not know Jesus, for those of you that are wanting this gift of salvation, even if you're online or, or you are here today, you know Jesus and the gift of salvation is the greatest gift you will ever receive. And today, some of you might be sitting here and you're not even sure if you have that gift of, if you received that gift of salvation. You're not even sure if Jesus is in your life. And this morning, if you, if you are here, you could lift your hand up or you could just say this prayer and just say that, Lord, Lord, today, Lord, I admit that I have come short. I admit that I've gone my own way. And, and this morning, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you came to die for my sins. And, and now, Lord, I commit my life to you. Lord, I want you to be the anchor of my life. And that is when it starts. And that is when we receive the gift. And this morning, do not forget to present the gift to those that are yet to know Jesus. John 7, verses 37 to 39 says, uh, to 38 says, sorry, on the last and most important day of the feast, Jesus stood and called out in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, who adheres to, who trusts in and relies on me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being will flow continually rivers of living waters. This morning, the ball is now in your court. How thirsty are you for the things of God? How thirsty are you for God's word? How thirsty are you for your life to be transformed, to be like Jesus. And I just want us as a church to just stand as we just pray over us as a church that this transformation series has not just come and gone, but like we've heard, you know, in the beautiful stories, or even as we heard Oliver's beautiful testimony of how his life changed. And this will become a process that we continue, that we continue to become like Jesus. Let's just pray, Lord, as a church, we come to you. We come to you, Father. We say, Lord, we come to you and we surrender to you, Lord. We want transformation to happen in our lives. We want to reflect you. 
We want to be like you, Jesus. And I just pray for us as a church, Lord, that the work that you've started in each one of us, that you would bring it to completion. Lord, what you have started and and planted in our hearts and our minds, those seeds that you've planted, whether it is to just start reading your word or whether it is just start serving or whether it is just start giving or, or whether it is just start going to connect or whether it is starting to reach the loss, that we will not allow the enemy to move us away from what you've spoken into our lives. We will not allow the enemy to destroy those seeds that you have placed in our hearts. So Lord, as a church, we just come before you. We surrender our all to you, Lord. Help us be like that beautiful butterfly that we could be all that you've called us to be, that we will be transformation as you would see us, that we will be living our lives to the full, living our lives in purpose individually and as a church. So Lord, I just pray that you will seal those seeds. You will seal what you've placed in our hearts. And Lord, that we will see fruitfulness as a church because of the transformation that is happening within us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you, God.